This podcast is part of the Democracy Group. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your host, Corey Nathan. It is an honor to be a part of the Democracy Group, a network of podcasts that examines what's broken in our democracy and how we can work together to fix it. I have a big announcement. We are on Patreon. We wanted to create a space to have better conversations where we can still disagree and challenge each other, but in a healthier way uh, than so much of the toxic rhetoric of this political moment, just like what we've been doing here on this podcast. But now we are inviting others to join in the conversation. So if you join our Patreon, it gives you access to our moderated community chat where you can talk with me and others who've been a part of these uh, talks. And at higher levels, you'll gain access to exclusive TPNR merch, coffee mugs, ad-free episodes, and the ability to give input and even receive director credits on upcoming episodes. It's super easy to join. Just go to patreon.com slash politics and religion. It's patreon.com slash politics and religion. And choose which level is best for you. And as always, remember to subscribe or follow and keep writing those reviews. It's always fun to see what you have to say, good or bad. Usually I I, I prefer the good, of course, but, uh, you know, um, I I do appreciate the feedback. It's always constructive. All of it helps so we can continue having great conversations like the one we're having today with Pete Wayner. Peter Wayner is a contributing writer at The Atlantic and a senior fellow at the Trinity Forum. His books include... The Death of Politics, How to Heal Our Frayed Republic After Trump, which was the the book that we discussed the first time Pete and I talked on this program. He also wrote City of Man, Religion and Politics in a New Era, which he co-wrote with Michael Gerson. And he wrote Wealth and Justice, The Morality of Democratic Capitalism. Uh, Pete was formerly a speechwriter for George W. Bush and a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Pete is also a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times, and I'm grateful to have him as a multiple time contributor here at TPNR. Pete Wayner, it's so good to see you, man. How you doing? I'm doing fine. Great to be with you, Corey. Thanks for having me on, and thanks for what you're doing for public discourse and uh, for helping uh, deepen understanding on issues. So it's always great to be with you. Absolutely. So since you're a veteran of TPNR, I figured I'd, I'd come out swinging. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Start with a hard question. Um, oh. You, you mentioned in the Atlantic piece that uh, we'll be talking about at more length today, that your own life has been shaped by others of the Christian faith, including those who've listened to your questions and doubts. Mm-hmm. Um, you also alluded to this in, in your most uh, recent Christmas Eve essay in The Times, which I love. It's a, it's a yearly tradition now for, for me and, and, and many other readers. I was, I was wondering what kinds of doubts, if any, are you working through these days? Yeah, that's a that's a uh, that's a great question. You know, I'm I'm in pretty regular, almost constant dialogue, I would say, with pastors and theologians on a variety of issues. So, what are some of the ones that that I've dealt with recently, or I'm dealing with now? Uh, one is suffering. How does a good God allow suffering? I mean, that's a perennial, ancient question. I've written on it. Uh, the last time I wrote on it was a meditation on several chapters from the Brothers Karamazov where Dostoevsky um, deals with that question in a very honest, almost searing, searing way. In that book within the book, that that story within the story? The Grand Inquisitor, right? Uh, exactly. And the Rebellion, which is a preceding chapter, and then a, a chapter on uh, Father Zosim. Um, so that's that's one question. Um, another one that I'm actively engaged with, uh, with some pastors and theologians in this very moment is whether... Uh, the so-called texts of terror in the Hebrew scriptures actually happened or not? Did God actually order uh, or or validate or bless the the massacre of children uh, and innocence and everything that uh, that breathes? Um, the notion of original sin, the, uh, the the morality of people being born into sin and then commanded to live sinless lives, and if they don't live sinless lives, they'll be judged by God um, is Hell actually eternal damnation. Um, I had discussions recently asked, posing to people, if uh, if there's a 14 year old uh, boy on the African continent that uh, dies in a tsunami, it's never heard of Jesus or heard, but it was in passing and hadn't 
to use the vernacular of, of evangelicals, Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Is that person in eternal, constant torment um, and agony because he didn't believe? So those, you know, those are pretty deep questions. They're not questions uh, that uh, a lot of people are engaged in or care much about, which I certainly understand and respect and probably to some extent envy. But um, but those questions are are in my mind and uh, and I have to think them through. And I'd say one other topic is just hermeneutics. How do how does one as a, as a person of the Christian faith how does one interpret the scripture? Uh, what's what's the right way to to view it? Um, so those are questions that uh, that rattle around in my in my mind, and I'm I'm really fortunate because um, there are, uh, as I said, uh, pastors and theologians, people of faith, whom I deeply respect, who are willing to engage in those. Some people aren't. Uh, some people either aren't interested in those questions. I think some people probably fear them to, to some extent, because it can kind of rattle people's uh, faith um, to, to try and engage it. So I'm, I'm selective in the people with whom I, I uh, have dialogues with. Um, but I also want to learn uh, because, um, because I, if, if I'm in error, there are things that I don't see, whether it's theology or politics or any other arena in life, I hope I want to be corrected. I hope that uh, I'm not so invested in certain worldviews, certain ideologies, um, that I simply resist hearing counter arguments, especially if the counter arguments seem to be well reasoned and, and carry some weight. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully, I won't get too long of a way around the barn to asking this follow-up question, but the the church that we first started going to when I first became a Christian, circa 2000, late 2000, early 2001, was a church that were, were in the Santa Clarita Valley. I've talked about this before. It's a John MacArthur Valley, basically. Oh, he, yeah. he owns this valley and beyond uh, in, in quite literal ways, um, but certainly theologically, uh, Master's University is here. Um, it was Master's College at the time. And one of the first uh, quandaries I faced was uh, MacArthur, among other things, is famous for a literal interpretation, in particular of Genesis 1 and 2, seven literal 24-hour days right. about 6-something thousand years ago. And uh, I remember having issue with that, not that I didn't believe in a God who could snap his fingers whenever he wanted and create the heavens and the earth and however long he wanted, but I just... I, having grown up in an observant Jewish family, I, I thought, man, if that's what we're talking about, and if that's what the whole thing's contingent upon, we're kind of missing the point of the right. beginning of the story. So that's that. May hopefully that wasn't too long of a way around the barn of asking, you know, as we read through. You mentioned certain things in uh, in Chronicles and Kings and in the histories. Um, how 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 imp is your how important is what we would think of as a literal or um, N.T. Wright might call it a, a more concrete way of reading the histories. How important is that to you, to the rest of your theological framework? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a timely question. I'm, I'm not sure that I've settled on the answer to it, um, quite, quite honestly. Um, I mean, you know, those literal interpretation there's always a i think a pretty pretty large qualifier caveat on there because there's so many different genres in the bible i mean there's 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 poetry there's there's history um there's there's lament um you know so there are a whole range of different genres and so some things you one should not take literally and sometimes historically people have taken certain things literally when they were obviously meant figuratively so in the geocentric heliocentric debate right whether the earth rolls around the sun or the sun around rolls around the earth for 1500 years almost without exception because this this was the common understanding at the time was that the sun revolved around the earth there were plenty of people and churches including the catholic church that said that that was based on the literal interpretation of, of the Bible, uh, because there are verses and Psalms and elsewhere that seem to indicate that the earth doesn't move and that the sun revolves around it. Um, so people thought, well, if, if there's a literal interpretation of the Bible, the Bible is God's word, so therefore it must be true, then the sun must revolve around the earth. We, of course, know that it doesn't happen. There was Copernicus and Galileo and telescopes, 
So now it's, you know, universally recognized with a few exceptions, I would say, um, that, uh, that the earth revolves around the sun. So people in light of science reinterpreted the scripture, their hermeneutic change. They thought something that was literal actually was something figurative. Now you can do that on, on, you know, on a whole range of a range of issues. If there's a verse that says, for example, you know, the mountains clapped, is that literal? No, it's, it's figurative. The question of hermeneutics, of course, is where do you draw the line? Um, I think obviously as a person of the Christian faith, of which I am one, at some point, these things have to be true. It's not all figurative. I think, for example, the resurrection of Jesus was true, that it actually and truly happened. Um, and that's what I anchored my faith in very, pretty early in, in, you know, in, my, uh, in my journey. Um, but you know, the, the question that I raised earlier, which is uh, when you get into um, verses in Deuteronomy and Joshua about the massacre, say, of the Canaanites, and you read those, did that actually historically happen or not? Are we meant to interpret it that way? And um, I would say no. Um, I think the vast majority of the evangelical world would say, would say yes. Um, that's, that's a live question. It's an open question. It's worth having a discussion, um, a discussion about. Other thing I'd say about the inerrancy of, of the Bible, um, that is a relatively recent um, theological construct um, post-enlightenment. Um, throughout most of Christian history, the way that a lot of the evangelicals understand the term inerrancy is not how most people understood inerrancy. And it was particularly the product of a movement that the higher criticism uh, from the, from from German theologians in particular, but others that happened in the late 19th, early 20th century, which was viewed as an attack on the authority of Scripture. And so, what happened is that a lot of Christians and evangelicals, because of this attack on the authority of Scripture, decided to uh, try and nail it down. And and so, inerrancy became sort of the term of art. But if you talk if you talk to somebody like Tom Wright, you were mentioning him or N.T. Wright. Um, who's a, probably the leading New Testament theologian in the world, he doesn't use the term inerrancy uh, or even infallibility. He, he simply says, I believe in the authority of Scripture. And uh, I think the way he puts it is, you know, he believes it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's the word of God, uh, and we jolly well should take it seriously. Um, so even those terms are ones that are, that are, that are, uh, that are fairly, fairly loaded. Having spent most of my life in the evangelical subculture, uh, you know, for me to say that inerrancy is not a term that I'm comfortable with, or even that I wouldn't insist that the Bible is inerrant, that can raise a lot of alarm bells among evangelicals because the way they hear that the, is this is an attack fundamentally on the authority of Scripture, and so if you don't believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, you don't believe in Scripture really at all. And, and their whole faith crumbles. That's not where I am, but I appreciate the fact that for some people, that is a red line. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting you put it that way, because I have found that the theologies that th those whose theology depends on not, not just believing in, in a literal 24 hour day creation, for example, um, but also demands that of those who also say that that we're Christians, I find that to be a rather brittle faith, right. a rather brittle theology. Before we move on, I wanted to tell you about something else that's important. Money, <laughs> uh, specifically your money. In all seriousness, I wanted to tell you about my advisor and my friend, George Meza. George runs Meza Wealth Management and with George, it's not just about money. It's about helping us manage our present and plan for our future. And unlike a lot of other firms out there, George and I actually have a relationship. He knows me. He knows my family. And I know his wonderful family. I also know his firm and the incredible team he's put together from his chief investment officer to some of the other great people in his office, like Jessica, their head of operations that are always there to help me and with all aspects of our portfolio. You see, the thing is, I got a lot going on. 
I guess we all got a lot going on and I don't have the time to watch our investments all day, every day. And even if I did, I don't have the experience and expertise that Georgia's team collectively has. So we get the entire Mesa Wealth Management team, all their expertise and all their integrity. And again, it's based on George knowing me personally, knowing my goals and even the kind of risk that's appropriate for me to take, which, by the way, could change from one season to the next. And they're on top of all of that. So if you want George Mesa and Mesa Wealth Management to be on your team, just visit their website, mesawealth.com. That's M-E-Z-A wealth.com, www.mesawealth.com. And that will also be in our show notes, so you can check that. And now, back to our show. There's, there's a lot of these strands that are coming together for me, so bear with me as I'm thinking out loud. So I, I, I had doubts I guess I get out of the womb, I, you know, being a Jew, what are you without, without right. having doubts? Um, but I, I certainly had doubts. And as the more zealous of my uh, brother's sisters in, in uh, at Grace Baptist, the church I, that uh, we were going to, um, were warning me against the dangers of N.T. Wright and his work and, you know, his, uh, um, how unorthodox he was, uh, that, um, right around, I think I got to that third volume in the, in the big volumes that he wrote, yeah. the one on the resurrection around right. 2008, 2009. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not so coincidental because there were so many other things that were happening in our culture and right. that were, I was able to start articulating about mm-hmm. who we were as Christians in this time, in this place, in America, you know, that um, it was the resurrection, the book on the resurrection right. that allowed me to, I've had this talk with John Rouse that allowed me to think of, um, br- bring some other concepts together, like an open universe, yeah. uh, an active God, a personal God that's acting in his creation yeah. uh, right. and an open universe and there and get to the, the macrocosm, the microcosm and everything in between, including an actual bodily resurrection. Right. So while not all of the supernatural miracle mm-hmm. things, I, I don't think my faith in Christ is dependent on, um, but the resurrection is one of those either ors for me. Uh, but, and, and it's uh, Tom Wright's book on the resurrection that got me there. So, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, Tom's book, I think it's called the resurrection and, and the son of God, I think yeah. is, the, is the title. And it, it, as you said, it's the third in a, in a troika of books. Which are, we're on Paul. Um, Tom is particularly a church historian. I, I would say he's a theologian too, but I don't think that that is his first discipline, if if you will. Um, and he's he actually wrote a biography uh, in popular press. I think it was Harper Collins on Paul. Uh, so you know he's very acquainted with it. And that book on the resurrection, which I think was written around two thousand two thousand one, I may be wrong about that. It is, I think, the definitive book on the case for the resurrection. Um, probably at least the best book uh, in 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 a hundred years. Interesting personal anecdote. Just as I was early on in my Christian uh, journey, that question became to me the central one that I had to answer. And I was at U- University of Washington at the time, which is a state school. It's not a Christian school. And I was in English 171, and um, the uh, teaching assistant, um, at my request, I asked uh, whether I could do a paper, uh, it's an English class, on the case for and against the resurrection. And he actually told me I I could do it. He himself was not a believer, as as you might imagine. Uh, But that paper I still have tucked away in uh, in my files somewhere. And uh, it was just a, a back and forth. It was this is the claim, this is the counterclaim, and uh, trying to trying to engage it on on uh, on that level. I I wish I would have had the benefit of uh, of Tom Wright's uh, book at at, uh, at that time. But back then, I think there was a book called Who Moved the Stone by Frank Morrison, and a whole series of of uh, of other books on on the historical case on the resurrection. Yeah, yeah. I had some good preparation leading up to those big volumes. New Testament of the People of God was important for me to read, especially given my upbringing, because it allowed me to imagine myself in the first century and having similar conversations with my father that I did in the you know 20th and 21st 
uh, ultimately the 21st century. You know, if I had been there and walked um, on that dirt, you know, uh, at, right. at the time of, you know, Yeshua ben Yosef, mm -hmm. and then went home and, and said, Dad, I, I think, mm -hmm. I think I found Mashiach, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just one, one, one thing you said, which I, I just wanted to comment on briefly because of your own background uh, as, as a uh, person of Jewish, Jewish faith, and then and, and you migrated for Christianity. The conversations that I've had with people who are Jewish on, uh, on how they understand hermeneutics in terms of the Hebrew scriptures has been enormously helpful to, to me and to my wife. That is, you'll know this better than I, but, but these are from, you know, fairly deep conversations with, with these f folks, which is how do you as a person of the Jewish faith understand interpretation of scripture? And the, the theme that has come out from those conversations, at least one of them, is that there's something sacred in the discussion and the debate itself. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and that is something that I think Christians really could learn from. And it's the notion, too, that we're not going to fully apprehend the truth. Um, and that these places that we arrive at, the understandings that we have, are almost always somewhat provisional or at least open to refinement and, and to recalibration. But the, the way that, that Jews view um, discussion, dialogue, and debate um, strikes me as, as, as very impressive and, and healthy. And as I said, I think Christians, uh, particularly evangelical Christians, uh, would do themselves a favor if they better understood how people of the Jewish faith approach hermeneutics. I, at some point, I have to introduce you to my dad and, and maybe our, our Rabbi Choni uh, here at our, our local Chabad, because um, with the destruction of the Second Temple, it's these very conversations that over time sort of replaced the temple cult, right? Yeah. Um, the, the rabbinic movement and the conversations, the debates, the heated debates that you can actually see um, in, in the gospel accounts, you could see yep. in Jesus's interactions with some of the folk, you know, whether it was the Pharisees or others that he was interacting with. Uh, to me, some, in particular, Matthew 23, some see that as, as a heated indictment. I see that as a family conversation, you yeah, know? Um, one thing I did want to ask you about, I, 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 I mentioned already that I, your your Christmas Eve uh, contributions to the top New York Times are, are becoming a tradition for me. Uh, yeah. A couple months ago, you wrote a piece for um, it was a Good Friday piece for the Atlantic, and I, I was curious about if you could share with us your thoughts about the profundity of the crucifixion, the profundity of the cross, um, and, and and a Messiah on a cross in particular in distinction with the what a lot of non-Christians see as what Christians are representing today. D does that question make sense? It does. It does. As I recall, I started at that essay out uh, quoting a um, conversation that I had uh, with Peter and Christopher Hitchens, right. who, who were brothers. Peter converted to Christianity as an adult. Christopher was one of the four most prominent new atheists um, before he died several years ago of esophageal cancer. And uh, so we were in an event, I think it was being hosted by the Pew uh, Center on Religion and, and, and Public Life. And, and I asked each of them to, in a sense, return serve to, to state the strongest argument that the other person had. So to Peter, I asked, what do you think is the strongest argument that you've heard most difficult when you struggle with from atheists? And from Christopher, I asked a similar question. I said, what's the strongest argument do you think in terms of faith, the greatest contribution to you individually or writ, writ large? And his answer was, was interesting. He, he said, from paraphrasing here, it's close to a direct quote, which was the, how ephemeral power was. Now, he learned that as a young man. I think he went to Episcopal uh, or Church of England school. In any event, it was Christian education, and he was familiar with with Christian teachings, and that has stayed with him. And that he believed was was actually true. Even he, as a as an unbeliever, um, had had insights and intuitions about the how ephemeral 
power is. And, and that I use that as a launching point uh, to do a meditation on the on the crucifixion, because the crucifixion, in my estimation, is, you know, the symbol of anti-power. Right. The, the, you hear so much today about Christians and politics and elsewhere trying to seize power uh, and take power and use power um, for good ends, they would argue. But for them, power is 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 a profoundly appealing thing. And that was certainly not the message of Jesus. It was not the message of of his disciples. It wasn't really the message of the first three centuries of Christianity pre Constantine. Um, and yet, this is this fascinating question, right? Which is, how did this religion, which started as an obscure few dozen people within several centuries, basically become the dominant faith in the known world at that time? And the answer to that was basically love, caring for the poor, the people in the shadows of society, the weak, the outcast, uh, and, and so forth. But in terms of the crucifixion itself, from the Christian narrative of it, here you had the God of the universe not only entering the human story, the human drama, he's the protagonist within that story, and then he goes to the cross, willingly goes to the cross, and dies, and again in the Christian frame, uh, to take on the sins of the world. Um, that is how profoundly he loved us. That's what Christians believe. But the idea that the God of the universe would not only um, condescend to become human himself, but that he would actually go to a cross and be mocked, brutalized, and die is a very, very powerful message, deeply counterintuitive, to most people, and certainly to religion and to the understanding of God at that time. And so uh, that is one, I think, powerful um, implication of the crucifixion to, to me, uh, which is it's, it's, it's not a, a symbol of victory. It's a symbol of death and it's a symbol of sacrifice. It doesn't end there. Of course, there's the resurrection for, for those of us who, who were Christian. But the road to it uh, was 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 filled with that suffering. So that's that's one element. The other one that I would say, which has been helpful to me, um, because I can't answer the question of why why a good God allows suffering. Um, I mean, I've heard I think probably all the major arguments uh, put forward by by theologians and philosophers on that. I just don't find them particularly persuasive. What I do draw comfort from, though, is to believe that God himself entered suffering. And so that creates an enormous amount of empathy and sympathy. So this, for me, the way I understand it, and I think the way that the followers of Jesus understand it, is this is not a distant God unmoved by pain or unmoved by struggle or unmoved by the human story, but did enter into it and, and took on suffering beyond what we could even even imagine. And while that doesn't answer the question of why suffering exists, it does, I think, create kind of almost communion with God uh, in that. And I take some comfort in that, even in my own life, through periods of sorrow and pain and grief that I've experienced. Um, you know, I wish I didn't have to do it, and I, and I wouldn't go through it again, quite honestly. But having gone through it, there's there's some understanding that God can empathize with it. Um, and also, you know, the knowledge that even though I think many of us would not go through particularly painful periods, it doesn't mean that those periods aren't ones that can't be redeemed by God, that he can't take the pain or the rubble or the wreckage that may be there in, in an individual's life and somehow use it for some kind of some kind of good. So for me, the, the crucifixion is so central to my understanding of God and the Christian story that I think it's almost impossible for me to pry it apart from from how I came to understand it. That, that's helpful uh, because you, you you've talked about the empathy of Jesus to the point of weeping. Um, right. And 
I didn't quite work that into some other thoughts I have about the bigger picture. But if I'm going to need to think more about this, but if what comes to mind, and I often think about this, one of the best Bible studies on uh, the first few chapters of Genesis is, um, is uh, Steinbeck, his, his big book, as he called it. Yeah. Um, and the conclusion that he comes to at the end of East of Eden, which is, it's not thou shall overcome it like a promise or thou must overcome it like a command, but thou mayest overcome it at one in which we're participating in that monster, mm-hmm. that sin crouching out the door, right? Um, that we're participating in it. But because we're not God, um, we're indeed human um, and, and imperfect in, in all kinds of ways that inevitably uh, will include uh, pain and suffering, uh, much of which is of our own making. But God being the kind of God that God is, um, his suffering, he's walking through it with us in a very palpable way. Yeah, no, that's, that's a moving, moving account. You know, there was a, I'll tell you a, uh, an anecdote, which, uh, which may resonate with you, may not, but um, in any event, um, I'm, I host a, a monthly book club and we were reading. By, uh, by the way, Peter, you've been teasing me with this monthly book club for, I don't know if it's the same one that you're talking about, but someday, someday, <laughs> you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll earn my way into that book club. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great group of, of people and, and um, people whose, whose friendship I've really come to cherish and it, from whom I've learned. And we were reading, my recollection is we were reading actually some essays by Thomas Merton. And one of them had to do with suffering. So we had a conversation uh, about suffering. And my main role, and I, I would say to the degree that I have one in, in, the, in the book club, is I probably ask questions um, more, than, more than answer them. And then, so I was asking a couple of people in the book club um, what they make of suffering. And, and one person uh, who himself was going through a tremendous amount of suffering at the time related to, to health talked about how uh, god can use suffering to destroy the idols uh, in our lives and uh, he spoke powerfully about um, about that when he got done i said look i understand that god can use suffering to destroy idols in your life um, but i said what what about uh when there's suffering in your life and there are no idols that need to be destroyed. There's no larger lesson to be learned. It's just sheer pain. What do you make of that? And then I asked somebody, uh, Philip Yancey, who's, a, who's, a, who's an author of many wonderful books that have influenced me and my family, my daughter in particular. And Philip said, uh, Pete, um, I don't know why God allows suffering. All I know is he's on the side of the sufferer. Mm. And that had a lot of resonance with me. It meant a lot to, to me. I know for some people it wouldn't, because it doesn't really answer the question, certainly not intellectually, it doesn't. But I think it's tied to what I was talking about earlier, and the, the idea that in the Christian story that God is on the side of the sufferer um, is a source of comfort and hope, I would say, uh, for those of us of, of the Christian faith. So to, to me, I've been coming to an applicable understanding of idolatry in our own time. Mm-hmm. And for those of us who maybe grew up reading the Bible or hearing Bible stories, we might think of idolatry as something so far away Uh, something so different from what it is to actually worship God. But I think the more pernicious idolatry, um, the one that I'm guilty of right now, I'm sure, is what what looks like um, godly worship, but it's just a couple of degrees off, right? right? So we saw, I've been seeing a lot of these, um, you, you actually shared one on your distribution list, these memes 
Yeah. Um, the the one that you shared was a meme of um, uh, a picture of Jesus and a picture of Trump. And it said, if you're not sure you can vote for a convicted cr- criminal, remember you worship one. And it's hard for me not to chuckle um, because my first thought is y- y- you do know that Charles Manson was a convicted tri- criminal too, yeah. right? Right. You know, but um, uh, <laughs> so I, I could be kind of snarky and, you know, my Jersey elbows come out. Um, but there was, there was another one that I saw that it, it, it made me pause for a second and, and humanize, uh, may, may not consider the meme itself, but the person who was sending it. Right. It was, it was a, a more subtle one with Jesus standing over a picture of Trump um, in the courtroom. I, I don't even mm-hmm. know if it said anything. And I thought, and it was sent to me by, um, uh, or maybe it was just on a, on a feed that I was on, but it was one of Lisa's friends from Alabama. Mm-hmm. Um, and what came to mind, and may, maybe this is being too charitable of the sender, but what came to mind is we all have, well, a lot of us have friends, family members, people who are close to us who've been through challenges. You know, uh, one of my kids had a pretty serious drug issue um, that took him, you know, um, his you know, fortunately, he came out the other side, you know, it was a mm-hmm. three, four year battle. Um, mm-hmm. and, and thank God, he's, he's doing great. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what made me, th- it made me think of, you know, my kid, and mm-hmm. the, the, tr- the challenges that he's been through. And the, you know, folks who knew what kind of trouble he was getting mm-hmm. into, quick to judgment, quick to castigate, Right. You know, but I want, in my belief, I want a God, a gracious God over him, watching over him, protecting him, giving him right. strength to get through his trouble. So again, maybe maybe that's a more charitable view of these Jesus and Trump memes, but that's what I thought is kind of a protectiveness of our kid, a protectiveness right. of our family member or our friend, because he's he's ours and he's under attack from them, from mm-hmm. others on the outside. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I, that, that's that's about as most the, the most charitable interpretation of it as I could get. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty charitable. I'll I'll, I'll give you that. Um, and I think there's probably something to it. I, I, you know, I do think that I think this is a disposition that you have. I think really it's the ethos of your of your show and, and podcast in many ways, which is to try as best we can to enter into the. Um, understanding of other people to try and hear where they're coming from, learn about their stories, try and figure out how they became, who they became and why they believe what they, what they believe. And that's in pretty short supply in this world. None of us does it perfectly. All of us should do it, should do it better. And I think to the degree that we can listen to, to people, listen to, to their stories, you know, that, that helps us even if we, if we disagree with with it. I mean, that meme that, that was sent out, it was actually reposted by Eric Metaxas, yeah. um, who is a fairly significant p- figure within uh, the evangelical world. He, he wrote a biography back, I think, in 2009 on, on Bonhoeffer. It was actually pretty sloppy in terms of its scholarly quality and, and authentic Bonhoeffer scholars. Uh, had written reviews about about how much he 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 missed. It was essentially not Bonhoeffer, but Eric Metaxas's version of Bonhoeffer that that appears in that in that book. In any event, you know, Metaxas was a sort of, I would say, normal mainstream Republican. He was critical of Trump in 2015, I think early in 20, 2016 on the grounds of his moral character, and he's he's completely. Um, gone over onto the Trump side. He's he's enveloped. He's he lives in a world of conspiracy theories. And there's an awful lot of, I would say, darkness and anger that emanates from him and his, his podcast and the shows that he does and so forth. So it's a sad and re- re- regrettable, I think, turn that he's that he's that he's taken. There's a kind of fury and anger that that just radiates from him and a lot of people like him, which uh, which I think explain some of the phenomenon that we see within evangelical and fundamentalist circles in the context of our contemporary politics. I, I, I will say that in the reposting of that meme, 
what Eric Metaxas was doing was, uh, I think, quite literally blasphemy. Um, and he should have done it. Um, and um, because it showed those two pictures of Jesus on, uh, I think, outstretched arms on the cross and then Trump and saying that, you know, um, you, you, you had said to, 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 to your listeners what, what that meme had, um, had presented. So that's really problematic. Um, I think it is blasphemy, and I think it is it is uh, idolatry. Um, we all struggle with idols in our lives. There's just no question about about that. But um, but all of us are on a spectrum too. And in this case, I'd say they're more than a few degrees off. Um, I think they they really have widely missed the mark uh, in ways that, um, quite honestly, I imagine would grieve Jesus uh, yeah. if he, if he saw that stuff. Yeah, and you know, you really um, reckon with a lot of uh, these, a, a lot of these issues in in that uh, piece from late May uh, called "Praising Trump with Faint Damnation." Um, why, why is why do you think it's almost reflexive at this point? But why do you think there is a refusal to criticize Trump, uh, largely speaking, within the evangelical church? I think it's a complicated um, answer. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, political tribalism, which I know you've talked a lot about on, on your podcast, uh, the sense that you are on a team, you're within a tribe. And so anyone attacking uh, the, the, the leader of your tribe um, is, uh, you know, by definition, the enemy and that you are required by loyalty uh, to defend uh, him. I think if you put the best face on what evangelicals and fundamentalists who are ardent Trump supporters, and most of them are, would say is that um, that the left is an existential threat to the country, that Trump may not be perfect, but... Um, but his policies are infinitely better and more moral than Joe Biden's and the Democratic Party. And therefore, we have to defend him because if he loses, then the country loses, then our values that we care about will will, will be lost. They're going after us. They're going after our country. They're going after our children. So it's a world of uh, it's a Manichaean world. It's a it's a world of of children of light versus children of darkness, good and evil, God and Satan. And they think that they're on the side of God um, and that uh, and that Trump is really on the side of God. He's the representative in this in this particular struggle. And they have to they have to defend him. So that's I think that's the most charitable in, interpretation um, of it. I think that human psychology plays a huge, huge role in this. Uh, and um, I in my own conversations with Trump supporters, and I've had a lot of them. Um, including recently with a person who had been a pastor in the PCA, he's since left the PCA and is now involved in in, in ministry. In this particular case, he was not, he was not a particular tr Trump fan. But what I found interesting is when I went through the particular indictments, not the criminal indictments of Trump, but moral indictments of, of Trump, found liable of sexual um, assault, just re recently uh, convicted. He's now a felon. Uh, instigated a, uh, a violent attack on the Capitol, attempted to overthrow the government through, through the coup attempt, tried to provoke a mob to hang his own vice president, um, invited uh, foreign powers to intervene on the election. On each of the particulars, this individual said, well, they really weren't true. And uh, and he was more mild in this in this, but more broadly what I have seen is that particularly Christians who are supporters of Trump can't accept that he is who he is and that he's done what he has done. Because to do that would be to create an enormous cognitive dissonance within themselves. I think it's just too hard for them, given what they had previously believed, what they tell themselves they are, what they tell themselves that they believe as Christians. It's too hard in terms of their conscience uh, and their, and, and their, 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 uh, their psychology to accept that they are defending day after day after day, act after act after act, a man of borderless corruption. 
And so they have to deny that. They, they do a couple of things at once. One is that they they mitigate what Trump has done. They either deny that he's done it or in the case of Franklin Graham, I was writing about in the Atlantic, right. they say, well, you know, he, um, he uses locker room uh, talk as if that's the worst thing that Trump does. Um, that's their escape hatch. He's not perfect. He's a little rough around the edges. That's not the indictment. It's not an honest indictment of of what Trump has done. So that's the first thing I have to do is which is mitigate the moral depravity of Donald Trump. And then they have to elevate the existential threat from from Joe Biden and the Democratic Party. Now, I'm a conservative. I still am, even though I'm a Trump critic. So I share concerns about the left, but particularly the progressive movement. I've written about them before. But I think that's that uh that threat is 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 overstated and i also think that joe biden himself is hardly a tool of the left in fact part of his problem now is that the left isn't happy with him because he's he's not embraced many of the most progressive uh ideas that they that they champion but they have to frame this as this great existential struggle um a kind of bonhoeffer nazi moment and if you think that's the frame that you're in then you're willing to cut some ethical corners as the old saying goes you've got to break some eggs to make an omelet yeah uh, but what happens is the ends justify the means and they well you know trump maybe he's using means that i'm not really comfortable with but he at least understands the the the, the stakes um that are involved here the nature of this struggle that this is a wicked evil ominous an almost omnipotent enemy that we're fighting and you need somebody like trump who is a warrior who can who can who can defeat them i think that's some of what is is uh is 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 going on i want to say one other thing corey because um i understood in 2016 and said many times that i understood why people voted for trump rather than hillary clinton in that election i didn't share this critique but i understood it which is to say look um his policies would be better than hers and uh, whether it's the courts or 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 the pro-life movement or any of, of of a number of other things where i think that the evangelical and fundamentalist movement uh has really really gone off the rails is the fact that they almost to a person will not criticize him you could hold two ideas at the same time which is to say i think his court appointments are good but but he has also acted in ways that are morally depraved and they're deeply uncomfortable. And I need to say that as a as a person of Christian faith, as a person of conscience, very, very few of them will do that. For them, it's it's all in. And the one other thing that I'd say, which is, as they say in poker, the tell is <laughs> that in the 2024 GOP primary, you had one candidate in particular, um, Nikki Haley, who was least as conservative to Trump, lifelong Republican, successful governor of South Carolina, pro-life, um, who polls much better against Biden than Trump does. She would almost surely beat Biden and by a larger margin than Trump would if, if Trump even beats Biden. But she's not morally depraved. So you had the, the way a lot of my evangelical friends uh, and fundamentalists pose it, what they're comfortable with, to say this is a binary choice between a progressive and Donald Trump. And out of conscience, I have to go with Donald Trump. But in this case, it was not a binary choice between someone who was pro-choice and pro-life, progressive or conservative. There you had a very conservative, but morally serious, and defensible person in Nikki Haley versus a morally depraved candidate, Donald Trump, and overwhelming numbers, 75%, 80% white evangelicals went with Trump rather than Nikki Haley. They weren't looking for an off-ramp. Right, right. For them, Donald Trump is the personification now of what they want. Their ethics and his ethics are the same. And some of them may have thought that if they would get in and they would influence him, but he's influenced them. And I do wish that evangelicals would at least be honest about that point uh, instead of this affectation um, of, you know, this is just a binary choice and, and, and uh, 
there, there, there are no other alternatives and we're reluctantly supporting them. An awful, awful, awful lot of them are not only supporting him, but enthusiastically supporting him. And again, they won't call him out, certainly won't do it, do it publicly, but even privately. So I think it's there's a lot of ruin, a lot of moral wreckage in this. And I think it's doing enormous damage to the Christian witness. You know, evangelicals, if they were to to uh, name what of their one of their chief goals in life, it would be to try and win over people, convert people, to evangelize people into the Christian faith. And yet their conduct in politics generally, and particularly in this moment as it relates to Trump, uh, is alienating countless people, especially young people, driving them away from the faith. So the, their attachment to Donald Trump is so deep and so profound that even with the disgrace that this, this is to the Christian witness, they're, 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 they're not even thinking twice about that. That is how much of an idol this has become, how morally deformed uh, many of them have, uh, have become, uh, and how harmful it is uh, to the faith that they claim uh, to 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 uh, to hold so dearly, uh, and uh, and to the witness of of the Lord they say they love. Yeah, yeah, we saw a few examples of that this last weekend. One was a more politically um, one of the core tenets of uh, conservatism is respecting the rule of law. Um, I, I was surprised at how heated of a reaction Larry Hogan got for. It, it was a, it was a, I wouldn't say it was a benign tweet. I would say it was just a call for reason um, speaking from a classically or a, 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 a long time conservative with, with uh, conservative bona fides. His tweet was regardless of the result, I urge all Americans to respect the verdict and the legal process at this dangerously, dangerously divided moment in our history. All leaders, regardless of pop party, must not pour fuel on the fire with more toxic partisanship, to which I, I was, I was, I kind of cruise around all the news shows on Sunday mornings and Lara Trump was on CNN. And she said, Larry Hogan should have thought long and hard before he put out such a tweet. No uh, Republican should respect that. No American res should respect. And I'm thinking, are we, did we just hear and read the same tweet? Are we looking at the same thing? I mean, that's from a political standpoint. A similar, a similar example of that um, was in Trump's uh, Trump's interview on Fox News. Um, there was a question that they read. Ironically, the the meme that I was talking about before was Shannon from uh, Alabama. This one was Sharon from Alabama. So I haven't done this before. So bear with me. Here we go. This is Sharon from Alabama, and I think her question actually ties into what we were just talking about. How do you do this? And I know that you've said before that you've been sustained by the prayers of lots of Americans. I've seen pictures of people praying over oh, it's, you. It's incredible, actually. Her question is, um, she says, you've been faced with so much adversity and persecution for years. What's your relationship with God like, and how do you pray? That's Sharon from Alabama. Okay, so I think it's good. I do very well with the evangelicals. I love the evangelicals. And I have more people saying they pray for me. I can't even believe it. And they are so uh, committed and they're so, they're so believing. They, they, they say, sir, you're going to be okay. I pray for you every night. I mean, ev everybody, almost, I can't say everybody, but almost everybody that sees me, they say it. It's such a beautiful thing. Okay, so I so there's something so bizarre about that answer. It's almost comical, um, especially when he gets to the sir. Uh, it's always, talk about a tell. That's always a tell for right. me. Um, one of my first questions. So again, the question is, what is your relationship with God, and how do you pray? And he immediately goes to evangelicals love me. Right. <laughs> you know what is Paul doing? So, but. My, what I'm curious about, again, is as I think about our friend, at least his friend in Alabama, I think of Sharon in Alabama. Does Sharon, is Sharon from Alabama, the, the one who wrote, sent in that question, is she hearing the same thing I'm hearing? Or is she hearing kind of a projection, maybe what she wants, like, uh, not to psychoanalyze Sharon, who we, we don't even know, but, you know, we, we, we have these friends, we have these relatives, maybe, these folks from church that we know 
who would ask the same thing, right? Right, right. Yeah, uh, of course, yeah. Now, knowing Sharon in Alabama, it's, it's impossible to know. I'll, I'll, using her as a type. Yeah, I'll, yeah. We'll do it that way in terms of what she may have heard and meant by that by that question. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating exchange. I mean, this has happened now for, for you know, eight years, almost 10 years, in which Christians keep trying to get some kind of foothold as it relates to Donald Trump and faith. And he never offers it to them. If you <laughs> ask him what his favorite book of the Bible is, he can't, he didn't even know the names of, right. the, book of the of the of the Bible. And he's talked before, I think in 2016, where, you know, he, he, he didn't think he needed forgiveness, uh, you know, in terms of prayer for forgiveness. There are, there are these constant efforts to try and give them just a, just a scrap of food, right? Like, tell us that you pray. Tell us that you believe in God. That's just not Trump. Uh, he's, he's, he's the most sort of secular person yeah. uh, and immoral person that you can imagine. He's almost a prototype of a kind of secular New York person consumed, narcissistic, consumed with money. But beyond that, he's sociopathic. I, I, I mean that in a, in a clinical sense. I'm not a psychologist, but I've talked to people. And at the end, to make a judgment like that, you have to have somebody as a patient. But you're, it's also reasonable to draw conclusions from the way people behave, particularly someone as public as Trump. So I think he's, he's sociopathic. So I don't th think he, he, he has moral categories. I think for him, morality uh, is to Trump what color is to a person who's colorblind. I think he doesn't doesn't even see them. He's not a person of faith. He doesn't even pr really pretend that he that he is. So what do people like Sharon in Alabama and others make of that? Well, some of them would say, look, we're we're, we're electing a president, not a pope. They use the example of Cyrus from the Old Testament, the person who 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 saved the Jews, Persian king, but who himself was not a believer. So they would say, look, he himself is not a believer, necessarily faithful or not a very deep, not a person with a deep Christian walk. But that's not really of relevance to us. What's really relevant to us is whether he's advancing Christian values, Christian, uh, Christian, Christian virtues. But, you know, I think what you need to take into account Corey, and this goes to your first question, too, which is, you know, when Larry Hogan put out this benign statement, basically saying, let's not have violence in the wake of this verdict. And the, the Trump, actually, there was a person from the Trump campaign that said, your, your campaign is now over. Right. You're dealing with what is essentially a cult of personality. I just think you have to accept that as reality, not 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 necessarily even as a, in a derogatory sense, but just as as a as an observational fact. What what are the entry points to being a Republican these days? You have to deny that the election mm. was legitimately won by Joe Biden. So you have to buy into the stop the steal. And now you have to buy into the fact that the New York verdict, 12 jurors after 12 hours, unanimous verdict on 34 counts, that the whole thing was 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 rigged and that Donald Trump is a political prisoner. And that, as Eric Metaxas, come back to him, said it's the lowest moment in the history of this republic. All the low moments that this republic has had, the segregation and slavery and the way it's treated Native Americans and you know uh, transgression after transgression even compared to, to to moments of great glory uh that america has had too in the entire history of the american republic this is the lowest moment uh, but that's that's the entry point it's not you have to be a conservative you have to believe in limited government fiscal responsibility you need to believe in peace through strength you need to, to 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 believe in free enterprise. It's you have to worship at the altar of Donald John Trump. And if you do, you're in. And if you don't, you're out. And if you don't believe me, look at Liz Cheney. She was as conservative a member of Congress as you could have imagined. What happened to her? Kevin McCarthy, a Speaker of the House, campaigned in a primary against her, almost an unprecedented act. What was the sin of Liz Cheney? She called out Donald Trump for his lawlessness on January 6th. And that was a breach in terms of the cult of personality. And so out she went and she, she lost in, in the primary. And now who, is, who, who are some of the faces of the modern day Republican Party? Marjorie Taylor Greene, 
yeah. Lauren Bulbert, Matt Gates. Who are the spokespeople? Tucker Carlson, uh, Steve Bannon. Uh, you know, you go on and on, and and then you look at the people like Josh Hawley and Marco Rubio and Lindsey Graham and J.D. Vance and so forth and and so on. So I wouldn't be surprised if by any of this, if I think it's a shock only if you don't understand really what has happened, that the nature of the cult of personality, and uh, and the psychological de- and moral deformations that that have that have gone on. I mean, think about it. You know, I went through that litany of what this man has done. Libel of sexual assault. He's now a he's now a convicted felon. The role in January six and the insurrection, trying to overthrow the the, the 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 government, encouraging people to hang his own vice president, and it doesn't even move them. He could literally when when he said in early twenty sixteen, so I could go on Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and people would stay with me people thought that was hyperbole at the time that wasn't hyperbole that was prophetic yeah he he could shoot somebody he could kill somebody and massive numbers of his supporters would stay with him that is where we are now i don't take any joy in saying that i think it's a it's 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 a, a a moment of 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 extraordinary um lament and 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 uh it's disorienting but if you don't understand that if you don't understand the degree to which the republican party has been corrupted by donald trump then these things that happen every few days you know and and people you hear all the time like i can't believe that they did this or i can't believe he said that or i can't believe that they stick with him and to me it's like that's not a surprise at all. They've had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to take the exit ramp from Donald Trump, and they've refused every time. And a psychology of accommodation has happened, and they can't turn on him because to turn on him would be to turn on themselves. That investment that they've made in him, the 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 the, the, the uh, trade-offs that they've made in terms of their conscience and their their own moral principles is so deep. And so profound that I think for a lot of them, it would have a shattering effect on them if they turned on on him because they really would be turning on themselves. I think that's just too too psychologically painful for his uh, for his followers. I see the beginnings of what somebody said in 10 years, nobody's going to admit they ever supported Donald Trump. And I see the beginnings of that now in a lot of my conversations. Um, you know, there's any number of guys that I interact with that are ultimately going to pull the lever for Donald Trump. And they started out circa late 22, early 23. Um, one of them was a big uh, DeSantis fan. Another one was leaning more towards Nikki Haley. Um, when she ultimately ran, he, he supported her at first. Uh, but they're, they're all coming around to Donald Trump, even as they say, well, I, you know, I don't like him. And they do the, you know, the, um, the version of I, I don't I wish he wasn't tweeting as much or the truth social tweets uh, bleats right. or whatever, you know, so they're already planting the seeds for all uh, 10 years from now, being able to look at their kids and say, well, I never really supported him. Um, it makes me wonder, though. Uh, it makes me wonder if the person somehow goes away. Uh, I, I don't want to put what's in Yiddish called a Kanahara. I don't want to put a bad mm-hmm. jinx on it, right? But mm-hmm. if he loses 2024, that'll be election after election after election after election, where it's not just uh, losses for Trump, but losses for the Republican Party as a whole. Um, 18, 20, 22, 24. Um, but if the person goes away, is there then a vacuum that someone like a Nikki Haley, or I mean, it wouldn't be a much longer shot, but like a Liz Cheney could fill that then has a redeeming quality, if not the Republican Party, but more the conservative movement as a whole. Um, maybe maybe a better question to ask, it's, it's closer to home, because I, I look at the work that uh, our friends Curtis Chang and, and Russell Moore are doing. I don't know David, David French. I've gotten to know Nancy this year, which has been an absolute blessing Mm -hmm. um, and read Nancy and and Curtis's book, The After Party. Are you familiar with The After Party? Yeah, absolutely. 
you you had mentioned um, in the uh, in this in the Atlantic piece the the incident that uh, David was put through with the PCA. Right. Right. Um, we've talked enough about the like the stuff that's depressing, but I, I find the work that the after party is doing incredibly encouraging, despite the rejections uh, that they're getting and and the the attempted embarrassment that they tried to put David through and Nancy through uh, with that big event with the PCA. That work is just absolutely encouraging. Is there a pot? So the bigger question, whether Republican Party, conservative movement or the church, um, do you see an opportunity for the redemption of the church? Yeah, I mean, there's always there's always an opportunity for the redemption of, of the church. And, you know, if Jesus said that the, the gates of hell should not prevail against uh, against against the church. Um, so there's always opportunity. And, and I have a friend who years ago told me a line, which is, he said, you could be a theoretical pessimist, but you should be an operational optimist. <laughs> you, should, you should operate on the assumption that things can be redeemed and progress can, can, can be made. I mean, the way that I think about it, Corey, is uh, that we're called to be faithful, not necessarily successful. Whether you're successful or not, or whether movements or moments, there are movements that you're a part of, causes you're a part of are successful is largely outside of our, our our control, whether you're faithful uh, in any particular period of, of of time, how you conduct yourself personally and and publicly, uh, would you conduct yourself with honesty and integrity um, and, uh, and 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 embody even if perfectly kind of a series of virtues? Uh, do you act again even imperfectly with you know the fruit of the, the fruit of the spirit? Would people be able to describe you? more or less that way. I think that's what we have to take comfort in, which is we're going to act as faithful as we can in any given moment in time. And if this moment in time is disorienting or discouraging, you just need to keep at it and hope that it'll change because there are inflection points in the life of country, just like there are inflection points in the life of an individual. And often we don't see them coming. And you have to be ready at the moments that they come to take advantage uh, of them. I think that's the the approach we we should have. On the other hand, uh, you know, I, I I don't want to be a Pollyanna about this. This is a dark moment for the country, for the Republican Party, the conservative cause, and for the Christian Church. Uh, and in terms of the politics that we're talking about, the Republican Party, I mean, I think it's generational damage uh, that we're that we're talking about when Trump leaves the scene. You know, will it get better? Uh, I mean, presumably it will. On the other hand, he this I don't think you can overstate how Trumpified and magnified this party is mm. and how many miniature Trumps that have been created at every level of government. Um, you know, I named some of some of the people. Yeah. So the 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 moral sensibilities the, of the party have been have been corrupted. And Trump could leave the scene tomorrow and that you wouldn't see a snapback. No. You know, you, you went through that whole litany where you said, well, he's a loser, he's a loser, he's a loser. Well, that was true in 2024, too. And they overwhelmingly chose him. As right. I said, Nikki Haley polls much better than against Joe Biden. Um, and that was the, one of the arguments that that uh, that uh, uh, Ron DeSantis made. Right. Which is, you know, I'm as right wing. I'm as much of a culture warrior. Maybe I'm more of a culture warrior than Trump. He's a loser. I won by 20 points. Go with me. Did that have an effect? No, he got destroyed. He got, he got, he got obliterated. Um, so, you know, if Trump loses in 2024, their narrative is going to be that he won. You know that. Oh, yeah. yeah. The overwhelming number of Republicans don't think he lost in 2020. I know right. that sounds bizarre because it's not true. And it's so obviously untrue. But you're talking 70, 80 percent of Republicans are absolutely convinced that Trump won in 2020. He's going to continue that same narrative. They're setting the stage now. So when he, if he loses in 2020, if he legitimately loses in 2024, he's going to say that he won, and almost all of his supporters are going to say the same thing. So they don't even share your, you know, narrative that 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 he's that he's lost. They live in a different epistemic universe. Yeah. Than than you do. They live in a twilight zone. They live in a world of lies and a, and a world of conspiracy theories. Um, some of them are doing it unknowingly. They've they've bought into it. They they are a product of living in in a bubble. 
they, uh, the, their sources of information, the authority figures that they listen to, tell them these stories, and they don't have the discernment, the wisdom to see the, the lies that they are. They buy into it. So if you gave them sodium pentothal, right, the truth <laughs> serum, they would say, well, absolutely, hydroxychloroquine would, 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 uh, would fix COVID. Absolutely, Tony Fauci was getting paid off. Uh, and is responsible for killing hundreds of thousands of lives. Absolutely, the election was stolen. Absolutely, Trump isn't responsible for January 6th. Absolutely, the people who are in jail are political prisoners. Absolutely, he would he did not uh, commit any of the crimes that he's that he's been been charged with. That's the challenge. And um, you know, I'm temperamentally and dispositionally, and I think in my daily life, you know, a person that's relatively hopeful. On the other hand, I just can't deny what happens, and I, and I do think when I when I sort of self critique in terms of what I've seen about this moment and this movement, if you go back as as early as I warned about Trump, first piece I wrote was in 2011 in the Wall Street Journal when he was uh, pushing the birther movement, the racist birther movement yeah. about about uh, Barack uh, Obama, and I warned in the journal at that time. I said, "Don't play footsie with this guy." or this movement, or these conspiracy theories, you'll come to regret it. And then in 2015, three weeks after he got in to the campaign in the New York Times, I was warning about him. When other people were saying, this guy's a flash in the pan, there's no way he's going to win the nomination. It's like, no, I think I have a sense of what's happening within this movement. Um, and I don't think anything that I've said in my writing, if you went back, all the things I've written about Trump, I don't think I've gotten anything wrong about it. I've gotten things wrong in other things I've written about. I've certainly gotten things wrong in my life. But um, but I think in terms of understanding who and what Donald Trump is and what he would do, you know, if we had sat around, here's a here's a, a it's counterfactual, but but it's a thought experiment of a kind, right? Which is if you and I had sat around with a dozen Trump supporters uh, in uh, let's say October of 2016 or February of 2017 and said that Donald Trump would have done the things that he has done. Right. And we had said back then, would you stick with this man if he did these things? I think the overwhelming number of people would, would have said, no, no, are you telling, are you kidding me? The guy sexually assaulted a woman the guy, guys of, 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 of convicted that he's been indicted four times and all the other things that I've gone through. You think I would stick with that? A Republican, a person who believes in family values and the party of law and order and the party that was critical of Bill Clinton for his moral failures. You think I'd stick with this guy? Of course I wouldn't. I think they would have said that genuinely. Today they are with him almost yeah. to a person. And that tells you of what's happened, the corrupting effects the psychological accommodation that I was that I was telling you about, and I think we have to name that. I think that's where we are. I think it's 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 an accurate assessment of where we are, and to some extent, if you think about this like medicine, you have to diagnose the um, the ailment before you can you can begin to heal. But having said all of that, again, we're called to be faithful. Um, this country has faced harder times. We have we had the Civil War founding of this country, brutal elections like, you know, between Jefferson and Adams in 1800. We, we, we had the, the period after, after the, uh, the, the Civil War reconstruction, we had segregation, we had the violence uh, and, and, and disorientation of the late 60s and early 70s. So we've been through a lot and this country has a tremendous capacity for self, self renewal. So we, we can't become fatalistic, we can't become hopeless, uh, we can't become uh, inert. We have to continue to 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 try to do the best we can um, and represent for those of us of the Christian faith the faith as as best we can, um, and then to, to 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 in a sense hold lightly to the things of the world, and to know that there's an author of this story and this drama, and it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And in the end, it's a it's it's a conclusion, a denouement of of redemption and um, and hope and yeah. we're we're actors in the in that story uh, all of us one way or the other so i want to push back on one counterfactual sure. uh the, the imaginary conversation that we could have uh -huh. had in 2016 2017 and then i have two questions to uh to 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 wind down 
Sure. Um, so you have that conversation. You say to your friend in 2016, 2017, this is a guy who's going to be convicted of 34 uh, felony counts. Uh, he'll be indicted in four criminal charges. He'll have been found liable of sexual assault. Um, the largest uh, financial crime in, in New York state history right. to the tune of about a half billion dollars. Um, he'll have directed uh, an insurrection uh, or led an insurrection against the peaceful transfer of power, all these things. Right. I guarantee you, if I had that conversation 10 times, at least nine out of 10 times, the response to me would have started with the words, well, what about fill in the blank? What yeah. about Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton? What about Barack Obama and his fascist Marxist, blah, blah, blah. You know, what about, what about, what about? Um, I just think that the, the, the seeds were already, see in 2012, the antibodies seemed to exist to maybe indulge the possibility of a Herman Cain, a Michelle Bachman, a Sarah Palin, right. but we ended up with two decent, true conservatives, uh, a Mitt Romney and a Paul Ryan on, on the ticket. Right. Um, you know, but by the time 2016 rolled around, something happened to those antibodies and we ended up with something even worse than, than a Michelle Bachman. Um, Anyway, just that that's yeah. just my quick but we could talk about that next time we get together. I might be in DC uh in, in about a month or or um or two. So I'll I'll let you know if I'm coming and we can tease this out some more. Sure. So here are my two questions. I'll put it yeah. this way. One mm -hmm. of my um one of the most profound points that uh from the book The After Party that Nancy French and Curtis Chang wrote together uh, was they they were referring to Matthew 10 when uh the names of the 12 apostles uh were mentioned. Uh, the, and it mentions, you know, uh, so and so's brother was Andrew, and so and so was the son of so yeah, Zebedee, yeah. and mm -hmm. and he and his his brother, like uh, relational. It was all relational. Right. Um, two of the twelve were Matthew the tax collector mm -hmm. and Simon the zealot. Right now, for historical context, um, the tax collector was exactly what the zealots were zealous about. <laughs> or right. against, I should say, yep, and yep. and Jesus came along, and they were they were you know one of the first uh, disciples. And Jesus said, "Hey boys, it's okay. You disagree with him, and he disagree. Let's eat. <laughs> right. you know, get it again. Right. They they broke bread together. Yeah. So um, I I bring that up partly because remembering that account, and 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 a zealot and a tax collector made today's Republicans and Democrats look like you know. Uh, Look, it looked like they're basically on the same team. They were so right. at each other's throats at the time, um, especially given the historical context of that time and place. That gives me hope uh, and is maybe a little bit of a fuel, uh, a reminder to wake up and, and decide to be faithful again. Right. What gives you hope as sort of a fuel and a reminder to, to wake up and be faithful again and again and again and renew it again? Yeah, well, that's a that's a powerful uh, story that you uh, that that you told. Yeah, in terms of what what gives me hope is, um, I mean, part of it, I, I suppose, is just the contingency and the vicissitudes of life. Um, you just don't know how things are going to happen, how things are going to turn uh, turn out, uh, and some things sometimes things turn out better than you imagine. Sometimes they turn out worse than, you're, than you imagined. Very rarely, I would say, in life and in history do things follow a straight line trajectory. Um, and all sorts of moments and movements and individuals enter into, into, the, into the story and, and can alter um, things. So I'd say that's, that's one. The second is human agency that, that, uh, that we have seen time and time again throughout history that particular people at particular moments can make a difference. Um, I mean, I, for me, if you if you ask me about it, who is who is the embodiment supremely of that in the American story? It's Abraham Lincoln. Mm. He came. Oh, the you know, second right inaugural. The, Malice yeah, to none. Right, and Charity the first inaugural. All. Right. Let's 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 not be enemies, but but friends. His entire his life. Yeah. The the course of his life, the way that he changed, the power of his words his own decency, his evolution as a, as a person, the way he grew into a, a person more capacious, more generous in spirit, even through the Civil War. It's just an extraordinary story. Now, I don't expect that there's going to be a Lincoln that's going to, that's going to appear anytime soon. There's only been one in our, in our history, and even that was 
unbelievably fortuitous or provi- you know providential. But you can go through, you know, Churchill is another obvious example. There are lots of them who <clears throat> there are individuals who change the the course of history by uh, by their by their acts. Uh, a third thing I would say is. You know, back to the uh, the imagery that you were using, which is, you know, sometimes uh, viruses create their own antibodies. Mm-hmm. There's an enormous number of Americans, they're referred to by sociologists as the exhausted majority, who are not happy with what's going on. They're not happy with what with what we're we're seeing in our politics. They're not happy with what's happening, you know, in the Republican Party, but the Democratic Party either. So I think that there there's an opportunity for for something else. Uh, it's not going to happen between now and the election. It's not going to happen probably in the next several years. But I'm not sure that that we're going to sustain this. I'm not sure we can sustain this. Um, and I hope the better angels of 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 our nature emerge. Uh, they usually have, and 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 I hope uh, and sort of choose to believe that that uh, that they uh, that they will will again. But Again, I, I would say probably most fundamentally for me, it's it, it, it's probably my faith. Um, and it's it's faith not that the human drama is necessarily going to turn out so well in any given moment in time. Um, but it is that it is the the confidence uh, that that this is a drama, and and the drama has, uh, as I was saying earlier, an author and a direction, uh, and ultimately, that story that we're a part of, that we believe in, is a story of justice and the story of redemption. They'll ultimately, ultimately prevail. Um, whether they prevail in any moment in time, no, they never prevail completely in any any moment in time. It's 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 a broken world. Filled with broken, broken, uh, broken people, um, but it's not. That's not the full story. Um, and and if you, I think if we understand that better, um, that helps us get through the the difficult moments a, a little bit uh, a little bit easier um, because your pr- perspective changes. You're you're viewing things from a from a different angle, and um, and we, we don't. Uh, you know, we don't have all all our eggs in this worldly basket, and um, I, I'm kind of glad that we don't. Um, that's really helpful. <laughs> that's really helpful. I, I I had a feeling this would happen where I was planning on about an hour or so, and we ended up. Uh, um, it, there's so much more uh, I didn't get to. We didn't even talk about really the verdict. Um, so before I ask my last question, yeah, let's make uh-huh. sure folks can. Uh, how do folks follow you and? And uh, you know, find your work at the Atlantic, the New York Times, and all the great work that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. You know, all you need to do is Google my name and put in the Atlantic, New York Times, and uh, that'll connect you to those. Those are my two main outlets. I, I wrote this piece on the one I was referring to earlier in our conversation about Dostoevsky and suffering for for Plow uh, Magazine, and uh, uh, so it's uh, just Google my name, and if you're interested in reading things that I've done, um, you'll you'll find them. Yeah, I'll, I'll put links to the your writer's page for both the Atlantic and the New York Thanks. Times. Let me, in fact, Thank let me you. write that down. Um, and last question is, yeah. do you have any questions for me? Uh, yeah. What uh, what gives you hope or encouragement these days, either individually in your life or more, uh, more broadly? You know, the first thought that comes to mind is conversations uh, like these, um, but also you know, just daily conversations, uh, you know, conversations that aren't shared with, you know, an audience, um, conversations. I I was, uh, (laughs) I had this event downtown LA, uh, last Thursday night and, um, it was the, uh, fifth, I think was that the fifth game. Yeah, it was the fifth game. Uh, I'm a diehard New York Rangers fan. So, before the event started, I said, you know, I'm Sorry. not going to be able to, <laughs> I know. Um, but listen, anytime you win 10 games yeah. in the Stanley Cup playoffs, it's, a, it's yes. you've done okay. Fair so enough. I'm happy with that. Um, I would have been happier with the Stanley Cup, but, but that, so that day I said, I got to watch at least the first period, you know, before our event. So there was a hotel near, near the event. Uh, I went to the hotel bar and uh, I sit down just as the games, the puck's about to drop and this dude, you know, shuffles up. Hey, give me a Manhattan. I'm I'm in L.A. 
and I could hear New York, you know, it's yeah. pouring out of his vein, you know, like out of his mouth. Right. Um, and I look over at you're a Ranger fan. You're like, yeah, what do you think? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like talk, that's like, hello, I love you in New York. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, so I get to know him, you know, and during the commercials, we started talking. I, he's here to like build one. I'm here to build one of the big buildings, you know, he says, you know, and uh, I find out a lot about him. And then he asks me what, what I do. And I told him talk of politics and religion without killing each other. Um, I know I forgot how it came up, but that was the day that the, the verdict came out. I said, yeah, today's a big day. He goes, depends which side you're on. I'm like, listen, honestly, I'm not really on a side. I just think it's a prehistoric event. He's like, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm a conservative, but I, I'm not really a big Trump fan. But, you know, I'll probably go that way because of this and that. But here's the thing. Before we ever got there, I knew this guy had daughters in Florida going to school, that he was hoping to move down there, that he was uh, in the construction business. And, you know, like I knew all these things about him and we're both Rangers fans. So contrast that with a lady walks up and um, I forgot why she she piped in, but it, he said he goes, "I'm more of a DeSantis fan," and I said, "Oh, you know, I'm not really, I, I'm not really into the anti woke mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. but you know, we could talk about that. But let's go Rangers, kind of a thing." She said, uh, and she just went on a a rampage. Oh well, you you, why do you hate? all gay people why do you want to ban books why do you want to tell you know to uh, take my mm -hmm. right and i was like whoa this just went off the rails mm -hmm. so if that if that characterized if her contribution characterized these conversations i would be depressed mm -hmm. um we ultimately just shut up for about you know for as long as the the next segment went into the next commercial and it just put a pall over the conversation until mm -hmm. she finally just got her check and left. Mm -hmm. And then me and, and this fellow James uh, picked up our conversation. I'm like, hey, man, that didn't go well. You know? <laughs> so obviously, he's probably going to pull the lever for Trump in New York, which I clearly object to. But like me and James, as human beings, we had this yeah. connection, you right. know. Um, and at the end of the day, regardless of what which lever he's pulling, it created a distinction for me. There was there was a distinction between how not to do it. She didn't know my name. She didn't right. know his name. Right. She just started. Why do you do this? And why do right. you do that? That's not the way to do it. Um, yeah. And the funny thing is, she she and I probably agree on more things than not re regarding, say, DeSantis. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't want that, regardless of whether we vote the same way or have a s similar opinion about a certain politician. I don't know. That's just that seems to be destructive, regardless if you end up the same place on a particular voter or a particular politician. Whereas yeah. James and I probably disagree on more things than not. You know, yes. we talked about guns. We talked about all kinds of stuff you're not supposed to talk about. And yet here, James and I were rooting for the Rangers and we're still human beings. Yeah. Anyway, maybe that's a longer answer to your question. Um, but uh, in, in a weird way, regardless of whether I wish James would vote this way or that way, that gives me hope in a, in a weird yeah. kind of loving kind of humorous way. <laughs> Does yeah, that make sense? No, that, it makes sure it makes sense. I mean, this is, you know, I think it, that there's Christians would f refer to this. And so would others as, as personalism. It's the notion that, you know, that in the end, what matters are these personal relationships and there are human beings yeah. uh, that are, that are on the other side of these arguments and these differences. And to the degree that you can connect, invest in, get to know, get to understand, in some cases, get to like, and in some cases, get to love, uh, you know, other other people. Um, that's a powerful. That's a, that's a powerful uh, thing. Politics um, is important. Uh, I've been involved in politics for my entire life. I wouldn't be if I didn't think it was important. And I think the stakes are enormously high this time this time around. Um, but human beings aren't defined uh, by their politics alone or by politics primarily. And, you know, once you get to be my age and your age, the more I think you understand that uh, that there are there are stories behind every life. And many times there are there are stories hidden in darkness mm. uh, and in shadows. And um, when you get to know people and the trust is enough that they can share those shadow stories yeah. with with you you know that's the stuff that i think will 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 in, will endure yeah. and uh, which matters most yeah
Yeah, David um, David Brooks covered uh, some really poignant stories, especially that chapter on his friend Pete. Yeah, uh, in the most recent book. Um, but yeah, I you know I don't know if this fellow James and I would have gotten there in one conversation, but I felt at, at least that we were laying the groundwork if we wanted to stay in touch. Absolutely. You know, sounds like you were. Um, and, and he's already followed up with me online. He found the uh, the podcast and he's he sent me a message or two. So that's cool. You know, he knows that I defer with him on certain things, but in a way that you could see, uh, there's a smile on my face. Um, that 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 definitely gives me hope. But again, Pete, like one of the things that's been so cool about doing this project is getting to know fellows like you and our friend John, um, and and uh, developing some some really meaningful new friendships, um, and for folks to model. Uh, some of the things that David uh, Brooks talked about in his last book, yeah. like being with folks in their pain. And, and you've been uh, you've been there for me in very uh, real uh, ways. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate you. And I, I just I love talking to you, man. This has been great. It's been a great conversation. And we'll, we'll have we'll have more both uh, both on the podcast and uh, and in person. So uh, the, the journey continues. And so does the friendship. The journey continues. Absolutely. And as always, if you dig what we're doing, Uh, Remember to follow us and write that review and go to the Patreon, our new Patreon, patreon.com slash politics and religion. If you're having trouble finding our podcast, if this has just been forwarded to you, just type in without killing, without the G, you know, the killing without the G, without killing our big purple logo shows up and you can find me elsewhere online as well at Corey S. Nathan. That's C-O-R-E-Y, S is in Sam, N-A-T-H-A-N, at Corey S. Nathan. Now go talk some politics and religion, and we can't talk uh, Rangers. It's not fun talking about the Mets, but we can talk about anything else. Um, And most of all, uh, do it with gentleness and respect, and have a great week. You can't do that.